S Surface is a Seattle-based urbanist, designer, educator, and curator. With the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, Surface is the curational lead for arts at King Street Station, a gallery, performance space, and artist residency where communities of color can create and present their work. Surface was previously co-curator of the Alice and Artist Run Gallery. Uh, design in public surface was director of the Seattle Design Festival. Previously, surface was an architectural associate at Super Interesting, an editor at Columbia University, GSAPP's volume architecture journal. And before entering the architecture and curational field, surface designed <clears throat> sorry, a packaging and created still life and product photography for luxury fragrances. They earned the MR for Yale School of Architecture and the BFA in integrated design um, from Parsons School of Design. Welcome. Hi everyone. Um, thanks for showing up to this presentation and conversation. Uh, my name is Susano Hiroko Surface, and I am currently in Seattle, Washington, um, which I'll get to in a minute. So I just wanted to point out, I have two links up here on this slide, um, the slideshow itself, and then a little paragraph, or not a paragraph, a page of resources of things and materials that I looked at and referred to while I was thinking about what I was going to say to all of you today. Um, so now I need to figure out how to navigate through my slides. There we go. So um, I am currently presenting uh, on the indigenous land of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish people, which we do currently call Seattle. I um, always like to keep that in the room and you know have folks remember where we are. I know that all of you could be anywhere around the world, so um, that's why I'm not trying to do a blanket acknowledgement. Um, and I also want to invite you all to just be comfortable and, and move your bodies while we're sitting here. Um, and so. I'm going to talk through what I had originally hoped to be a presentation of scent-based projects I had done in addition to the ethos of how I got there, but COVID really put a damper to all of that um, from the beginning of this year. So what I actually ended up happening was I ended up uh, trying to sort of introduce why I was interested in these topics or why me, like why some architect or designer or curator exploring these issues and ended up almost making that introduction and grounding the presentation itself. But I did want to start with a few really cursory terms and definitions. So um, not being someone who's deep in the scent world per se, I don't have a lot of specific technical language about, you know, for example, why some fragrances might irritate me more than others. For me, it seems to relate to things that last a long time that maybe are pretty affordable and accessible ingredients, but I don't know what those are. I use design as a pretty broad term, kind of almost like uh, in the sense of like a gestalt or a total consideration for how things are made and how they get there. It almost refers to intention and it's definitely not limited to the professions of design like graphics or products or buildings, etc. Um, I am also not really engaging any in any debates about is multiple chemical sensitivities or sense sensitivity real. Uh, whether or not they are formal pathologies that are recognized by medical organizations, it's clearly documented that stuff that comes in through the nose hole impacts the body. And for some, it's a pleasant experience and other times it is not. Um, so in the United States, you can refer to court rulings by the EEOC and um, different regulatory bodies that have sided with people who say that they do have sense sensitivities. So for me, it is not a debate. There's plenty of documentation um, basically showing that things that are in the atmosphere do impact the body. And for me, I'm in the work that I do broadly, something that ties all of these sort of very disparate worlds together is an ethos of working towards access and inclusion for as many people as we can as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> I, I do tend to get a little prickly about, um, you know, when people say, oh, folks with sensitivities are sensitive as if that is a problem versus an attribute or a value. So, you know, why would we want to cater to all these whiny babies who need a safe space? Why wouldn't we? Like, why, you know, do you really want to be that person who, who shuts that down? Like, I personally don't. 
Um, obviously, things that impact the body are so personal. Nobody likes to be told what to do or what not to do with what they put on themselves or let alone what aromas they might exude from themselves. So also really wanted to keep that knowledge alive. So why me? Um, why me? So I'll start with my sort of early intro to the topic. I'm personally a fancy fragrance enthusiast with an early career background doing technical packaging design in the luxury fragrance industry. Um, my sort of first intro to the thought of fragrance as an art form came when I was a student at Parsons with the two co-founders of Visionaire magazine, Cecilia Dean and Greg Foley. What's on this slide are examples of publications they produced around maybe 2003 to 2005. The one on the left is Visionaire's scent issue where photographers were paired with perfumers and each page corresponded with a scent that had a, it was like a scent and image were designed for each other. And um, the second one, something similar happened, but with taste. So those are almost like very fancy Listerine type taste strips than a little box that you would taste and that matched an image. So just having my mind blown by A, what a publication could be. It's not just a book or a newspaper. And that scent and taste could be a publication that could be an art form. They weren't just, you know, products that you buy. They're just kind of existing, not taking things for granted. Um, these are just a few examples of when I did this luxury cosmetics industry stuff. I did graphics and technical production. So I was not the person doing the branding for Dior. I was coming out of college. You don't really get put on that level of stuff. But I did the technical production. I had to um, work with research and figure out things that worked with international environmental and safety compliance for the packaging deliverables of everything from a bottle to a box to a plastic bag. And so these are just a, a few of the products that I did work on the production side when I was employed at Seneca Design, a uh, New York City uh, production firm. I am a person with Japanese heritage. I'm mixed Japanese and German. Um, and in my Japanese heritage, Kodo, or the way of incense, is one of our free sort of most important cultural art forms. So always embedded in from how I was born was that this is a crucial medium to my people, my ancestors. It's how I've connected to my heritage as a person living in diaspora. Um, I am a curator of, you know, a whole lot of stuff. Um, this is not, uh, this image here is not a piece that I have curated because I actually have not yet gotten to work with scent but it is an example of something that interests me. Um, I work with artists and have recently gotten my first application for my gallery from artists interested in doing a scent event. And I want to find ways to welcome scent into exhibition and public spaces. For example, the, the three folks who just presented prior to me, Devin or Chevalier or Erica, those might all be artists that I could work with. And so I would love to you know, figure out how to make those things happen. It's a really beautiful and fruitful puzzle and collaboration. Um, oh, I'll go back a little bit. So I'm also, you know, like an ex exhibition designer. I do that stuff. I'm interested in the vessels and the delivery methods and like just how that stuff looks and works and how people can engage with it, how it can be controlled. And I like to think of um, what is the delivery system that can empower scent artists to make their experiences genuinely opt in. It doesn't have to be like, it's this amorphous cloud that, um, you know, we have no control over or walking into. Um, I'm a person who lives with environmental illness and sensitivities to certain fragrances and airborne allergens. I'm often advocating for my own health and safety alongside fellow community members with the same needs. I consider myself a disability justice advocate who also recognizes that for some, olfaction is a bodily sense by which they can experience arts and culture in ways that other experiences might not be accessible. For example, a blind person might not smell a painting, but like they can't they can't see the painting but they can smell the, the fragrance um so there can be different ways that scent um i think it's often been maligned as a, a point of contention that can harm or injure people or just make them uncomfortable but for others it can really be like just a sense that they can access in an experience in different ways um as you can all see and as i've told you um I'm a person of color who has experienced the really specific flavors of classist and racist harassment where you know, like my food, my home, my body have been labeled as too pungent, weird, foreign, and stinky, and yet has survived that still proud of who I am and who my people are. And um, I think it was Devin who really, um, I heard today talking about colonialism and I saw the presentation yesterday. So where like sort of the, the body and race and culture can, um, 
really have deep implications around what stuff smells like. Um, and I'm also a specifically like non-black mixed race person of color. Um, I'm a person with light skin and probably a 2A, 2B hair texture. I have kind of my picking and choosing of cosmetics and products that work for me and other people have spent a lot of time researching and, and finding things that work for them. And so like when you start talking about things like fragrance-free policies in the workplace or in public spaces and maybe whole groups of people might find that really was a huge barrier or you know might then be put in the position of having to purchase all new products or something like that that's just a thing to also have to to consider and um i'm also a municipal employee i'm a project manager with the seattle office of arts and culture the government agency my gallery that I run is in this building here, which is Seattle's King Street Station. It is our main Amtrak station. So it's about as public as a building gets. Um, we're not just an art gallery, like a nonprofit might be or museum. We are a government walk-in facility. There's certain laws we must abide by around making it accessible to people. Um, I am one of the staff members who's currently advocating for and now working on our workplace's own scent reduction policy, which is distinct from a fragrance-free policy. Um, as a needed community uh, accommodation as well as something that I need for my own workplace. And you know, obviously we can't guarantee who all comes through our doors. Uh, our facility and our mission is to lift up the voices and provide opportunities to present the work of communities of color and people who have not yet had access to exhibition spaces before. So it's really about making sure that people feel welcome, that they own it. Our public literally owns it because it's a taxpayer funded facility. So we have to make sure that we aren't just saying like, oh, you can't come in if you're wearing perfume. We cannot do that kind of thing. And we, we wouldn't want to anyway. And um, so I work on a lot of just policies, but I also have some something to do not so far with sense, but with regulations and laws and code compliances, ANSI, ISO, building code. It's nerdy. I'm not going to get into it, but I do that kind of stuff as well. It's not totally artsy fartsy <laughs> in this world. And then um, so here's just a few examples of the facility, um, the external plaza with a public art installation I uh, commissioned. This is what the interior of the space looks like when there's not art. So it's, it's big. Um, you can move the walls around to reconfigure them. And then here's just a few examples of exhibitions that we have worked on. First one was uh, called Yahout. Uh, it was a about 210 artist exhibitions. So there was a whole lot of people to wrangle. Um, there was performance. There was pretty much every art form you could think of from avant-garde video art to woven baskets, to performance, to photography. Like if you, if you could make art of it, it was probably in there. Um, and um, a, a more recent one, the one that's actually up since we are closed is the, this one was pretty much straight photography and there was one video. So they can really vary. And I hope and have the ambition to someday be able to present scent either as the topic of an exhibition or just sort of embodied and embedded in other exhibitions and events that might arise. Want to be able to deal with it instead of just saying, no, we can't do that. Still learning. And I'm also, just like all of us, a person who is extremely aware right now that tiny invisible things floating in the air can get into the body and impact you irreversibly. <laughs> so I feel like there's a lot of that, that thought going on right now too. So I kind of just ended up with like, how do you deal with this whole puzzle? There's a public health and medical implication. There's law, human resources, and workplace issues. There's solidarity with liberation movements, specifically disability justice and anti-racism that have come to the forefront in my own work. There's the politics of scent and smell generally. There's sort of artistic and cultural impacts and importances of scent and fragrance. So it's, it's kind of a, a big stew, right? It's a complex picture. So now I'm getting to what to do. And um, I think that the first thing and that I want to emphasize is that it's not actually all about 100% limiting all fragrances anywhere at any time. I, probably this is a crowd that is well aware that there's there might be fragrance, there might be scent, there might be odor, those are different things used different ways. Um, and so we in our policies for arts and then pretty much anything I would do is just like an independent human being, whether it was connected to that workplace or not. I would always be thinking of like centering the people who are most impacted by an issue and working from there. So if someone comes to me and says, hey, like, I can't be in this space as long as you have 
scented hand soaps. Like that's a starting point. You can work with that. I, I tend to work better in with specific cases than sort of abstract, oh, maybe some of these people over here might need or think of this. It seems to arise better in, in, in the case study model. And so something that really seems to have come to the forefront is simple just communication expectation management, consent and advance notice. We cannot guarantee that our space is flawless or scent free, but we can tell people that we use unscented products in our facilities. We can tell people that we do not have full control over what everyone wears in, and they walk into this facility and so we cannot guarantee that it's fragrance free. We can say things like that. We can put it in our advertis advertisements or Facebook or social media postings, signage, so that people know what they're coming into. They can decide before they show up and are told either you can't wear that perfume or there's going to be fragranced stuff here. If, if they can be okay in that environment. We can put, you know, in our invitations to people, if possible, please arrive not wearing perfumes. So we can manage the expectations. We can control what we can control. We can provide air purifiers. We can design seating arrangements. We can purchase the cleaning products. We can create staff and public policies. Um, we do think holistically. It's um, kind of the whole range of scent. So we are looking at Perfumes, like you spray it on, you choose to wear it. There's stuff that's in the laundry detergent that you use that you may or may not have thought about. There's gasoline wafting up from the train station. There's always going to be something in the air, right? Um, we don't want to make people feel like we're constantly in a toxic stew waiting for stuff to make us die. Like we really want to also emphasize like that this is deeply important to people and to our cultures. And so we want to really go case by case and honor and anticipate complexity. And that seems almost like a, a pretty, um, almost drastic oversimplification of what these possibilities could be, but that's kind of where you arrive, where you take all of this complexity and then you dial it down into what is actually needed or how to deal with it, and it's pretty simple. So um, that's pretty much the introduction to this body of work and the ethos that I'm operating under as I look forward to eventually, when I have a facility again, um, creating these sorts of events and, and exhibitions. And I've been so uh, watching this whole summit and how things can be presented digitally that relate to fragrance has been really amazing. I've also attended a few online classes with folks like Dora Goldsmith who've done digital events and so here's my gratitude slide for everyone who's helped me out or talked about this with me, including, and I should have put you on there, Clara. I'm sorry, but you're here. And um, so I've had a lot of support in, in, in this research and work. And um, so maybe I'll just open it back up to the conversation again and encourage folks to go to these bit.ly links if you want to see more slides and get deeper into the work history as well as this resource list of just some simple links where if you want to dive deeper into any of these topics which probably could have been a whole talk in themselves there's a little starting point for y'all so that's what i've got to present and would like to hear some questions and comments <laughs> thank you susano and i'm sorry for mispronouncing your name susano i saw the tilde and i put it on the wrong letter <laughs> <laughs> it happened it was really interesting <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure I'm not the first. Um, yeah, you're dealing with a lot of different factors. So, so Lakenda has a question. Um, do you find that you have an ability to make exceptions in scent for natural perfumes and scents, which typically don't trigger sensitivities? It might, it, that's another case by case. So perhaps they don't trigger sensitivities, but I would be conscientious that they, they could trigger a host of other things. Someone could be allergic to anything. Um, someone could have some kind of I don't know, they might just dislike it. They might have a trauma response with an association to it. So it, it continues to be case by case. Um, yeah, but, um, and also I personally have not been involved with something where there was a firm fragrance-free policy. I've been to spaces that have it, but our, our workplace is not so cut and dry. And we are not trying. <laughs> For folks who are interested in, in sort of the question of whether naturals or synthetics trigger, uh, I'm here to say that they all trigger and definitely do some research into, into the IFRA um, regulations on, on, on them on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, uh, so that links is in the resources. It's 
there we go. So actually, that brings me to the question that uh, the the design for sent resources um, link didn't work, unfortunately. Oh, okay, well, um, well, but we'll, we'll we can send it out to everybody after. Bitly, <sighs> we'll find it. I know it'll be there. Uh, and then Tammy, uh, now it's I think six a.m. in Australia. So yeah. good morning, Tammy. Uh, says thank you. Interested to know more about opt-in solutions that you have discovered. Ooh, so let me pull back up some of the slides. So I would actually go back to some of these early things that I showed, like this example here with the um, these little vessels. This is actually an exhibition of wine where people were sniffing it, but sort of somebody took upon themselves to create a deliverable in an exhibition space where an individual sticks their face in this cone and, you know, it's not just wafting around. So that would be an example of opt-in. I mean, it's, I can see it's got some flaws, like, you know, with touching things, it might be a hygiene issue, whatever, but, you know, and they not only designed the system, but it, it looks really cool. So it's also clearly a visual opportunity. And then I might even name um, these, these little publications as a form of opt-in where it could be a solitary experience. Th these folks actually also did an exhibition of at least the taste ones at Art, Art Basel. So they were they had a kiosk where you could, I mean, the taste one's kind of obvious where, you know, you have to put that in your mouth. Um, but the fragrance ones um, kind of could be a little bit more personalized. Uh, I, I sort of hesitated to put a bunch of these examples that I found because I, don't, I didn't want anyone to be confused to think that I had designed or created them myself. But uh, I can think of numerous um, ways uh, that people have had a lot of fun with creating these individual opt-in opportunities. The Cooper Hewitt Museum has, had, did a few shows where it was more of like, things that you get your face close to, or you push a button and things come out. Yeah, and uh, I mean, we've had some experience with this as well. And, and typically, if, if there's either a signage, um, mm -hmm. or there's some sort of thing where you have to engage with it consciously and purposefully. Like which you see I like know. a whole room, or like maybe you walk through a vestibule that's sealed, and you, if you choose to walk into that room, you experience it. So maybe some people can all walk in there, but it's not like you, like you walk past the museum and you're just blasted with funk. <laughs> so and Totally. Um, okay, so so Danielle, uh, hi Danielle in San Francisco says the wine exhibition was amazing. The, sorry, the wine, wine exhibit was amazing. There were various other ways to engage with sense and a lot of data and storytelling with it. Um, Rudy wants to send their appreciation from SF California. As I am studying somatic psychology, they write subtle bodily sensitivities are often overlooked in our society. Big thank you for what you're doing. Thanks. Yeah, it's a uh... Like it's a, let's say, an emerging topic. <laughs> so where do you see your work going uh, as, as, this, as this sort of exploration continues, Susana? Like, what's, what's the, um, what are you interested in really tackling in this sort of puzzle? Well, there's a few things. I mean, there's like, I, f I feel like um, there's this sort of facilities and exhibitions and curatorial side of it. I mean, it, it kind of really is this slide. It's... Um, you know, I, I don't foresee myself jumping off a cliff and going full on into the scent world, but I haven't jumped off that cliff with pretty much any topic. Um, and so I have an ambition to create and collaborate with people on a scent and a, a scent based exhibition and or events or events of some kind like that's just an ambition that I have and hopefully there's some interest in that. And I also will continue doing the policy and facilities work in light of the, the larger picture of the liberation work that undergirds all of the, the practices that I carry. So it might take shape as maybe I'll end up creating a policy for my department that ends up influencing citywide policy. It might be that I, an exhibition happens in like 2023 that's like a cent centered thing. It might be you know, when we finally open back up, we work with folks to be able to have sage our facility. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, so uh, unclear. It's part of the stew. As Sean asks, and this will be the last question, and we're going to move, um, move on to Robert. Um, but Sean asks, uh, who gave a fascinating talk, by the way, on uh, Thursday or Friday of last week. I can't remember which. But Sean says, uh, thanks for the fascinating presentation. Have you thought about site specificity vis-a-vis scents -vis that are already present in and around the King Street train station? Definitely. I mean, you can. Now, I will say it's a very urban environment. So the scents that are naturally present 
um, right on site. It's a, it's a lot of train fumes, like gas or uh, I don't really know, coal, what are they? I, I don't actually know how trains move in the United States. Um, I think it's petrochemical. We're in the border of our Pioneer Square, which is like a historic Gold Rush era colonizer neighborhood, and then the Seattle's Chinatown International District. So Asian food would be another amazing and awesome local scent that is pretty characteristic of our place. And then more broadly speaking to our region, there's like the plants and just the atmosphere and that um, evergreen. Yeah, I think about it. Uh, if, uh, and then, sorry, go ahead. I, well, our last question is from Julianne uh, Lee. Hi, Julianne. Uh, she says, it strikes me that there is not a whole lot of medical research into scent sensitivity, hence the gaslighting slash ridicule, even while IFRA also appears to overextend its control tendrils. If people with scent sensitivities are still struggling despite the existence of IFRA, do you envision a future where more advanced med medical research will inform public policy regarding scent? Absolutely. That would... I think it would do a lot of help both not only just convincing that it exists but also coming up with solutions to help people manage our environments i do think that it's it changes over time as we sort of start creating new materials or moving through different densities of space um i also do think that there is a lot of research around this topic preferably but it might not be labeled scent or chemical sensitivity. We do know about things like environmental illness, AKA sick building syndrome. It's very clear that things off gas. There's tons of evidence around um, other, other atmospheric irritants or risks like asbestos or, um, you know, the just pollution generally. Um, so I think that we don't, like I said in the beginning, we don't need to establish that things that are scented in the atmosphere impact the body, but um, if it's a matter of labeling it scent sensitivity or chemical sensitivity, then sure. Uh, Susanna, I really want to thank you for your thoughtful and complex uh, topic that you're exploring here and, and the time you're taking to share it with everybody. Thanks and for having me and appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, likewise. And uh, we'll probably put this online with your permission, so we'll talk about that later.